So I just want to point out that the Ramazzini study comes from one of the world's top cancer research institutes. And Dr. Belpoggi is a renowned pathologist, and her support team consists of individuals who are experts in conducting and evaluating experimental carcinogenicity studies. But another important feature of the Ramazzini results is that even the highest field strength used in that study, 50 volt per meter, is actually lower than the Federal Communications Commission's permissible exposure limit for the general population and is more than five times lower than the FCC's permissible limit for occupational exposures. Clearly, the FCC's exposure limits need to be revisited. I certainly urge that there be government actions. The Federal Communications Commission, as Ron has already said, have standards that are not protective of human health. They must be revisited. Communities and state and local governments also must take action. Steve Jobs and the Gates family did not have these devices in their homes. And the issue of environmental research that I am the guest editor of with uh, Dr. Melnick and Dr. Anthony B. Miller um, does include an article just published by Israeli social psychologist Gadi Lessert documenting the array of physical, emotional damage that can occur with these devices. So the exposures in this study are relevant to us today. Hello and thank you to the, all the reporters joining us today for the release of a major new study from the Ramazzini Institute who has just completed the largest animal study evaluating radio frequency radiation exposures at levels mimicking base station cell tower limits of radiation. We'll also be discussing the findings of the draft U.S. National Toxicology Program study on cell phone radio frequency radiation. We'll take your questions after Dr. Belpoggi summarizes the findings and we hear brief remarks from our panel of distinguished scientists. I am pleased to begin the online news conference by introducing Dr. Fiorella Belpoggi, Director of Research of the world-renowned Ramazzini Institute. What we have found, I have to tell you that um, our study is not yet concluded. We have examined all brain and heart uh, of uh, the exposed and control groups uh, animal, about uh, 2,500 uh, animals, and uh, we decided to to run to do that because in 2016 we were very much impressed by the publication of the results of the National Toxicology Program. At that time all the control group and IDOS group was already evaluated and we had at the time already seen the increase of this rare type of tumor that is the heart schwannoma. Schwannoma is a tumor of the Schwann cell that are the uh, cells that cover the nerves and are the same kind of cells that were seen in some epidemiological studies. In Italy in particular, uh, a manager of a company was compensated for an occupational disease because he, develop, he developed a schwannoma of the facial nerves um, associated to the strong use for uh, four, six hours a day of uh, cordless or uh, mobile phones. So the two facts, the finding of the National Toxicology Program and the epidemiological findings led us uh, to publicly uh, announce uh, our results and to publish them. So it is not my role now to take, uh, to take measures. My role was to be sincere with the public and to announce what I have seen together with the National Toxicology Program scientists. Now we have to ask people to, take cautious, to be cautious with these uh, devices, to avoid them used by 
by children, for example. Don't use when you are pregnant and your baby in, 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 uh, could be exposed. Don't use clothes to your uh, babies during lactation. I have seen pictures of mother lactating their children that use the phone in the same time. So also to have a use when we need it. Don't play with iPad or phones when it is not necessary. And again, I am sure that the companies could improve their device, for example, with headphones that are easy, easy to be used, not like they are now. And I, I mean wire headphones, because the other ones are dangerous like the phone. And also the emission from the antenna should they be in some way improved from the point of view of human health? Because now we have seen a lot of resources employed in empowering the signal, in giving more performance to our devices, but never in the light to protect human health. So the message of the Ramazzini Institute to the public is we have seen a low hazard. It is not a very strong hazard, but 7 billion of people are exposed. So the people that could be affected by lesions or diseases by radiofrequency could be thousands and thousands. So um, our appeal is... Uh, please, uh, precaution about uh, these devices. So as reported by Dr. Belpoggi, in the Ramazzini studies in which rats were exposed lifetime to GSM modulated radio frequency radiation at field strengths of 5 to 50 volts per meter, there was a significant increase in schwannomas of the heart in male rats exposed at the 50 volt per meter uh, level compared to controls. In addition, there were increases in precancerous Schwann cell hyperplasias. And I call these precancerous because these are abnormal growths. They are increases in cell numbers which have the potential to convert to benign and then cancerous lesions. So I've looked at the combined incidence of the schwannomas and the precancerous Schwann cell hyperplasias and found that to be highly significant. Uh, people familiar with uh, p-values, this had a p-value of less than 0.01, meaning that there was a one, less than 1% probability that this result is due to chance. So these results identify Schwann cells of the heart as a target of RF radio frequency radiation in rats. The increase in schwannomas and precancerous lesions of the heart in the Ramazzini study are consistent with the results from the NTP study and demonstrate that these, which are proliferative effects in the cancer process, are a reproducible finding. And reproducibility in science strengthens our confidence in the validity of observed effects. In the IARC evaluation of radio frequency radiation in 2011, in which I was a participant, the expert panel concluded that a causal interpretation was possible for increases in brain cancers and acoustic neuromas. These are vestibular schwannomas that have been observed in long-term cell phone users. Uh, Dr. Hardell, I'm sure, will speak more about that since his studies were instrumental in that decision. The concordance now seen between rats and humans and cell type affected by radio frequency radiation strengthens the animal to human association. Therefore, I believe it's time for regulatory agencies to make strong recommendations for precautionary measures, to update their 20-year-old guidelines, and to strengthen regulations to be more public health protective, and also because the results from the Ramazzini Institute and the NTP occurred despite claims that this type of radiation is incapable of causing any adverse effects, I believe it would be irresponsible 
to implement any new wireless technologies in neighborhoods where people would be continuously exposed before thorough evaluations are made of potential adverse health effects. I'd like to move on to Dr. David Carpenter, a physician and epidemiologist and director of the State University of New York at Albany Institute for Health and the Environment. Dr. Carpenter? First of all, there is strong evidence from people that use cell phones intensely for long periods of time that there's an increased risk of gliomas of the brain and acoustic neuromas of the auditory nerve, the latter being a type of swanoma. So the implications from this study are that there is a danger to individuals that live close to cell towers, so they're being continuously exposed to the radio frequency radiation coming from the cell towers. Now, the exact magnitude of that risk is still not clear because there have been relatively few health studies of people living by cell towers. There are some. But Clearly, there is a risk documented from people using cell phones and now documented by these animal studies. We should not place cell towers near schools, near uh, residences. We should put them as far away from people as possible. Cell towers direct a beam at the horizon, and so it falls off at the distance as you go further away. Now, there are other implications one of the things that's very concerning to me is the move to having wireless computer classrooms in schools. Because if you have one router and 20 or 25 kids on a wireless laptop, you have at least this magnitude of intensity of radio frequency radiation. And it's a mini, mini microwave oven. And that's going to have adverse effects on, on the children. Another issue that's really very important is that there's a major movement in pretty much in all countries of the world to develop small cell 5G cell towers that are transmitting antennas. And by the nature of this frequency, they have to be placed very close to every home, separated by about 300 meters. These are going to be put on every street in the country. And these are going to continuously expose everybody living nearby and everybody that's simply walking down the street. And that increased exposure is going to increase the risk of cancer and several other diseases that you'll hear about in a moment. Now, the good news is that there are ways of having access to modern communications that do not increase your risk of disease. Wired connections don't cause radio frequency radiation. If you have a wired earpiece to your cell phone, if you use a landline rather than a cell phone, if you wire your computer connections in school classrooms, uh, wireless is very convenient, but it comes with a threat to human health. And while none of us are saying we have to do away with it, it can be used safely. We need to position cell towers as far away from people as possible, and we need to inform everybody that while these technologies are good, they come with a certain risk as well, and therefore should be used with caution. We are going to move on to Dr. Deborah Davis, visiting professor of medicine at Hebrew University, who chaired the Israel Institute for Advanced Study Environmental Health Trust Expert Forum Forum on Wireless Radiation and Health when the Ramazzini study was, the design was presented. She's formerly a member of the Scientific Advisory Group of the National Toxicology Program. And Dr. Davis is also President of the Environmental Health Trust. Thank you, and thank you all for being on this call, which is being recorded. I'm very sorry that we don't have Dr. Hardell with us right now, and so what I'd like to do is give you a brief summary of his remarks. These remarks from Dr. Hardell can be found on our website and on the website of the National Toxicology Program because he has submitted comments to them on their bioassay, but I'm going to address the relevance of the Ramazzini study. Uh, Dr. Hardell is a physician, and he has remarked to many of us that cases of acoustic neuroma, while they are benign, actually result in disfiguring and disabling consequences to people. For example, surgery to remove an acoustic neuroma, which is a tumor around the hearing nerve, a thickening of Schwann cells, 
So neuroma is also called schwannoma. Surgery to remove those tumors can be disfiguring, can result in permanent hearing loss, and can result in losing the ability to smile, to even chew and eat food properly because the entire jaw can be rendered slack because the nerves are often damaged in the process of that surgery. So while we know that the neuroma, also called a schwannoma, is technically benign, its consequences are not benign. Uh, Dr. Hardell, as a physician, of course, has treated this, and he's particularly concerned about the human data on glioma, which his team has been developing over the past 20 years. Again, I refer you to his testimony, which was submitted March 12th to the National Toxicology Program and can be found online there as well as on uh, our website. And in that testimony, not only does he note the nature of the acoustic neuroma, schwannoma, he also reports on some very interesting data on changes in patterns of cancer that may reflect increases in uh, cell phone use. And most importantly, he shows us the consequences of, combined, of what we know from the time that the International Agency for Research on Cancer reviewed the evidence, experimental evidence and human evidence on cell phone radiation. At that time, based in large part on some experimental findings and human findings, the International Agency for Research on Cancer concluded that cell phone and other wireless radiation constituted a possible human carcinogen, category 2B, the same category as uh, lead and engine exhaust at that time. Since then, Dr. Hardell and his team and French scientists working with French national data on glioma have reported increased gliomas in those with the longest period of use of, of cell phones. And they have shown consistently that when you have data on persons that have used phones for 10 years or more, you have an increased risk. And the combined meta-analysis that Dr. Hardell and his team have done indicates that the most likely increase is a threefold increased risk for those who use phones on the same side of the head for which, um, where they get their, their tumor. Now, um, I'm not going to go into great detail of, of his work, but I really want to encourage you to look at his submission and in particular some graphs that he has developed subsequently concerning the Ramazzini study. Now, the Ramazzini study is fascinating because it uh, showed uh, increases not only in uh, glial cell uh, tumors, but in hyperplasia, both for the brain and for the heart. And Hyperplasia is regarded as a precancerous condition, as Dr. Melnick has said, and when you combine the animal data for both the hyperplasia and the tumors, you find a much more significant result than when you look solely at the uh, single tumor alone. And the reasons for combining these are that it is generally understood in toxicology that Hyperplasia is a precancerous condition and of indicating an abnormal response and should not be dismissed as a benign condition. So in some, we are seeing growing evidence of concern from both the experimental data that we talked about here today and the human data that uh, Dr. Hardell and his team um, have put together um, for um, the past 20 years. Um, I'd, I'd like to also add a, a few comments about the relevance of the schwannoma finding in the heart to humans. In fact, uh, there are very, very few cases that have ever been reported in the scientific literature of schwannomas, which is the thickening of nerve cells within the heart. Only 16 cases have been found in the literature, but we really have to ask how many strokes or heart attacks could, in fact, be due to this underlying mass of uh, irregularity within the heart. We know that there's been a big decline in the autopsy rate around the world, and particularly in the United States. So it's entirely possible that this could be a factor. In addition, there's been a recent report that I, I find very concerning, that younger Americans um, have not shared in the general drop in deaths uh, from heart, heart disease. Now, we know that obesity, of course, is a factor, and we see growing rates of obesity in younger people around the world. But in the United States, the United Kingdom, Canada, and Australia, 
in all of these countries, there has been an increase in hospitalization for heart attack in young adults. And I'm raising this simply as a question because we don't understand why there should be a 4% annual increase in heart attacks in females in Australia, more than a 50% increase in little more than a decade. And I think we need to start to ask about this and whether or not this could be related uh, to uh, cell phones as well as, as, as other factors. One thing that Dr. Hardell has remarked to us all about is the absence of American research on human health in this area. The last American study to be published on brain cancer and cell phone radiation was published in 2002. Despite the fact that there's been other studies done internationally on this topic of the relationship between brain cancer and cell phones in the United States. We have no research funded right now underway on this question at all. We are, as Dr. Carpenter said, flooded with dazzling new technologies that we use, that entertain us, that enthrall our children, and the adult market is so fully saturated, but many school districts are now giving kindergartners iPads and these have never been evaluated, both for how well they work and for their safety. And we need to think more carefully about it. I want to conclude with letting you know about the French government test agency. The French government has its own frequency test agency, and the U.S. does not. They actually picked uh, of several hundred phones and evaluated them, and they have reported, as is available on our website today, that nine out of ten phones that they tested exceeded the European standard for microwave radiation of a two watts per kilogram. My good friend Frank Clegg, the former president of Microsoft Canada, assures me that the telecom industry knows how to fix these problems. And with a little pressure from the right places, Mr. Clegg says, he has no doubt that they will be able to do just that. 